And uh, so this, uh, we have come a long way. Actually, uh, this is the seventh in the series. Uh, first, during the first webinar, uh, we uh, saw the uh, historical uh, progress uh, in defining the disease itself, because uh, nobody knew what diabetes was. Uh, it was known as a sugar disease. So we started with Ebus, papyrus, and then uh, zeroed in on uh, the pancreas. And during the second uh, webinar, we uh, covered the puzzles of pancreas where people knew that the pancreas was seat of uh, diabetes, but they were unable to uh, uh, take out the internal secretion for uh, experimentation. And then uh, Banting uh, came with this idea and uh, he almost bet his life on uh, the pancreas and sacrificed a lot uh, in his personal front as well as uh, professional uh, front. Then uh, he succeeded along with his colleagues, four of them. So we saw the uh, unity initially and then uh, the problem which arose between them later on as uh, the insulin fame uh, became a big talking point between them. And at the time, uh, even though insulin uh, saved a lot of people, but these four men, uh, they uh, just fought with one another and made the uh, discovery a little sour. And then Nobel Prize was awarded to insulin. So it was a crowning glory for the discovery. Uh, later on, insulin uh, further was developed. The crystals was isolated. The structure was identified. And a uh, lot of uh, technologies got introduced. We saw a lot of uh, you know, advancements about crystallography as well as uh, protein uh, structure uh, detection. And a lot of Nobel Prizes were awarded, almost uh, six uh, Nobel laureates. Uh, many of them are uh, chemists, actually. They were not uh, people of medicine, but they uh, advanced the science of insulin therapy a lot. Then uh, we have come to the seventh webinar today, where we are going to see four uh, uh, top uh, physicians who were practicing just before insulin got discovered. and then around the time of discovery and then beyond. First, we'll start with Frederick Madison Allen. So he was uh, quite famous for his Allen starvation diet. Actually, he was an authority on diet. So in fact, he wrote a 1,200 page uh, book, uh, which is called Total Dietary Regulation in the Treatment of Diabetes. So uh, because of his diet, a lot of people lived, but they had their own sufferings. Allen believed that the previous diabetes treatments had been ineffective because they attempted to substitute fats for carbohydrate. So the doctors were giving a lot of fat and uh, reducing the carbohydrate content much. Naturally, when uh, somebody eats fat a lot, uh, it led to acidosis followed by early coma and death. So Alan believed by increasing the fat content, probably we are accelerating the death of these young children. Alan found that a very low calorie liquid only starvation diet could eliminate glycosuria and acidosis. Very difficult to follow, especially for children. But he uh, had a uh, lot of uh, children under his care. In fact, it was like a lodge where he will uh, close the door and won't allow them to get out because once they get out, they will eat uh, whatever they want and then they get back to the acidosis and coma. So he kept uh, them inside the rooms for many months. Patients were held to diets as low as 400 calories per day with carbohydrates virtually eliminated from the diet. So their growth got stunted, but then they were living. That was the only blessing for them. Patients who dropped out of the treatment and returned to their former diet would naturally die shortly afterwards. So patients who followed the diets faithfully would become undernourished and die of starvation, although they would live longer. But the beauty of his uh, dietary treatment was when insulin got discovered, there were uh, hundreds of patients who were under uh, his treatment who could survive those few months after their diagnosis and then get on to take, go on to take insulin and then survive. So because of Alan, a lot of children uh, survived that uh, phase of their life. Alan opened uh, an institute called Psychiatric Institute in New Jersey 
the world's first clinic for sufferers of diabetes mellitus on April 26, 1921. It was just before the discovery of insulin. And it got filled with a lot of uh, type 1 diabetic children. He uh, wrote uh, two important books. One was a monograph of Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, which, uh, 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 when he, which was uh, written when he was heading the Rockefeller Institute. And then he uh, moved to uh, this New Jersey, uh, his own institute, where he wrote this big book, which was considered as a Bible uh, as far as dietary uh, treatment for diabetes is concerned. Uh, Elliot T. Jocelyn, uh, we uh, always uh, call, e call him EPJ. Uh, EPJ is Elliot T. Jocelyn, always mentioned the period 1914 to 1922 as the Allen era of diabetes. Because of his starvation diet, many children could live and see the light uh, with uh, insulin therapy. Allen's undernutrition therapy gave the much needed hope for longer survival for these children. Uh, Elliot P. Jocelyn and Allen had two decades of friendship. They were poles apart. Actually, uh, they, uh, the uh, manner, the, uh, the way they talked to the patients and the way they practiced, everything was different. Uh, while uh, Allen was uh, a very cold person, he, he was very unfriendly to the children. Uh, he was like a, a hostile warden. But uh, Jocelyn was like a friend for uh, uh, even a two-year, three-year-old kid. So they were poles apart, but then they were uh, having a good friendship because uh, Elliot P. Jocelyn practiced what Allen uh, advocated as starvation diet. So he also followed the same rule for his patients so that the patients could live longer. So he had a lot of admiration for Alan. Alan referred famous patients like Thomas Alva Edison and the philanthropist banker Josh F. Baker to Elliot P. Jocelyn whenever such famous people wanted a second opinion. He himself referred his own patients to Dr. Jocelyn. One of his patients, one of Alan's patient was Elizabeth Hugh the daughter of U.S. Secretary of State, who also contested uh, as, uh, in the U.S. presidential election, uh, Charles Evans Hughes. So she went directly to Toronto to be treated with insulin by Frederick Panting. So before uh, she could travel to Toronto, she was uh, under the care of Dr. Allen for a few months. She survived. And then uh, once uh, the news uh, reached U.S. that insulin got discovered in University of Toronto, the family chose to take her to uh, Toronto directly to be treated by Dr. Banting. Uh, Hughes weighted, weighed just 20 kilogram when she left. She was a 15-year-old girl, but weighed only 20 kilograms. Three months later, Alan, along with Elliot P. Jocelyn and other luminaries, visited Toronto, University of Toronto, to see the uh, resurrection of patients uh, by themselves. And Alan visited Hughes in Toronto and saw a healthy 15-year-old normal weight uh, girl. So Alan just said with his mouth wide open, oh, that was the only uh, word he uttered during the entire uh, time he spent in that hospital because he couldn't believe his eyes that uh, Hughes would gain such a weight and become a normal uh, bright uh, girl. So once uh, insulin arrived, to US, somehow Alan uh, couldn't keep up with the uh, great uh, progress. The discovery of insulin, in fact, ended Alan's prominence in diabetes treatment. Diabetes specialists were no longer in great demand as insulin made it possible for any general practitioner to treat diabetes. So a lot of doctors started treating diabetes. So naturally, Alan's uh, prominence uh, couldn't be maintained. And he was also a very uh, cold, uh, uh, ruthless doctor. So naturally, uh, children, they, uh, they disliked him. So in 1927, he marketed an oral hypoglycemic pill with Squip company that was made from mulberry and blueberry leaves. But the pill failed and left him in deep debt. And in 1936, his institute was shut down. He died in 1964 at the age of uh, 88. So that ends the Allen era. Actually, in fact, he is remembered for his starvation diet. Then came uh, Frederick Banting, the surgeon who uh, was inter interested in orthopedics and who discovered uh, insulin along with his colleagues, uh, Best, MacLeod, and Colip. So for one year after discovery of insulin, uh, 
uh, Banting treated a lot of uh, patients. So only one year he was treating patients. Within that one year, he became world famous and uh, such letters, uh, people who did not even know his name, they just wrote to the doctor who cures diabetes, Toronto out. So this was the address uh, written by this uh, kid, which reached promptly the uh, desk of Dr. Banting. So uh, he did not require any address for the postman to deliver it. Again, Monsieur D. Professor, University of Toronto, who has found a uh, uh, means of uh, curing diabetes, Toronto, Canada, that's it. So again, such letters started coming, pouring in from all over the world. And a lot of children wrote to him. Dr. Banting kept a big uh, folder where he kept all the letters which he received. And he was very prompt in replying. Uh, to the children also. So you can see, dear Dr. Banting, hope you are, uh, arrived safe and well. So the child is uh, uh, knowing uh, about Banting's uh, program personally. The same day you left, I gathered some, uh, some more, uh, some nerve together and gave myself the first shot of insulin. So the child has written a personal note to Dr. Banting. Such was the uh, admiration and uh, uh, the rapport which he developed uh, for the patients. Again, another letter, dear Dr. Panting, I am a little uh, guy in Texas uh, who is taking Iletin. Iletin was the brand name of insulin. It is making me feel better and I am so happy. I want to thank you. Merry Christmas. So unfortunately, for after a year, he, uh, he got divorced from diabetes treatment. He wanted to do something else and uh, moved on. The next person, the next savior uh, is Dr. Robert Daniel Lawrence. We simply call him R.D. Lawrence uh, from London. Uh, he was uh, a young assistant surgeon, very promising uh, surgeon. Actually, he got trained in surgery in King's College, London. And he was practicing with a cadaver for a mastoid operation one day. So a bone chip flew into his eye and uh, the eye got infected. The infection never settled down. Then they investigated, found that he had uh, developed type 1 diabetes. The infection left him permanently impaired uh, with a permanently impaired vision in one eye, which ended his career as a surgeon permanently. In 1920, this represented a death sentence for the 28-year-old doctor. The diagnosis of type 1 means he is going to live probably for at most six months to one year. His health continued to deteriorate and Lawrence moved to warmer climates of Florence, Italy and set up a small clinic practice there. So he started seeing patients there. He was all alone. Uh, he was living in a first floor apartment. Uh, even climbing the stairs was a big ordeal for him because he was in acidosis. His diabetes took a turn for the worse after an attack of bronchitis and an early death seemed inevitable. He was going down sick and then insulin supplies began to reach UK. And in May, 1923, a colleague at King's College Hospital cabled Lawrence with an urgent message. I've got insulin, it works, come back quick. So uh, Lawrence uh, in Italy received this message and then he started uh, and reached uh, King's College where no beds were available around the time. He actually, in fact, uh, uh, was kept in the veranda for some time. He received his first injection of insulin on May 31st, 1923. So he almost lost his life due to diabetes. So he knew everything about diabetes personally. His life was saved by a momentous medical breakthrough, the discovery of insulin. Lucky to be alive, R.D. Lawrence devoted the rest of his long productive professional career to the improvement of care and treatment of other people with diabetes. So even though he got trained as a surgeon, he became a diabetologist with whom he shared a hard-won empathy and understanding. So all patients, he, uh, he, can, he could just feel how they uh, are suffering and uh, how the society is being their illness, all that he knew personally. After being appointed by a chemist, because he was a surgeon, actually he couldn't uh, be appointed in a surgery unit because of loss of vision in one eye. So he uh, biochemistry department accommodated him and he set up a diet kitchen. This was first of its kind in the world. So he uh, employed cooks who could cook the correct type of food for the children with type 1 diabetes. 
where patients could learn about diets and injections. So this kitchen was quite large. Children will be invited to the kitchen and they'll be taught everything there in the kitchen, including the food, how to inject insulin, everything. In 1925, he published the first edition of his book, The Diabetic Life. This is the book, The Diabetic Life, which is meant to uh, be read by the doctors initially. And he had a famous patient, H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells was a journalist, sociologist, historian, and a famous author. He wrote more than 100 books, which included The Invisible Man, very famous book, The War of the Worlds, and The Time Machine. He had futuristic prophetic visions with respect to science, technology, war, and social order. Wells' diagnosis of diabetes came in his early 60s. When he was around 60, he developed diabetes. Uh, it was in the year around 1930. In July 1931, he became a private patient of the famous physician, Dr. R. Lee R. Lawrence. That's how Lawrence met uh, H. E. Wells, the famous author. In 1934, uh, both of them together, they uh, wanted to start a foundation. In fact, the story goes like this. Since H. E. Wells is a very famous author and a rich man, Dr. Lawrence approached H. E. Wells um, for help, financial help to start a, a, a unit in uh, King's College London. He thought H. E. Wells will uh, oblige immediately and give uh, a fabulous sum of money. But for his dismay, H. E. Wells did not do anything because he, uh, he did not even write a check. But then he uh, wrote a, a piece of uh, article in the Times newspaper. He wrote a long letter in Times newspaper which caught the attention of a lot of uh, readers of the times and the uh, donations started pouring in. So it was more than what Dr. R.D. Lawrence expected from uh, H.G. Wells. Uh, so uh, just as an interlude, uh, H.G. Wells actually was very famous for his predictions. Uh, I know, uh, I think many of uh, you will be knowing that he uh, was talking about nuclear weapons in the book, The World Set Free, which was published in 1914. So uh, actually it came uh, true. And then he talked about man landing in the moon. Actually the book was The First Men in the Moon, 1901. And then he talked about genetic engineering in the book, uh, The Island of Dr. Murray, 1896, which got published as early as 1896. Again, it became a reality. Then he, uh, in the War of the Worlds, uh, he mentioned uh, the laser beams can be used as swords and that also became true. And uh, then he talked about uh, second, a possibility of Second World War, again that became true. And he has, got, he has made few other predictions. We don't know whether we will be living uh, to see those predictions. One is he predicted that man uh, one day can become invisible by some uh, technology and time travel going back and forwards, back and forth, and then interplanetary warfare. All this was predicted by uh, Dr. Hitchi uh, uh, And uh, uh, the birth of diabetes association happened uh, uh, Dr. Lawrence uh, at a meeting held in the house of H.G. Wells, uh, the British association uh, was formed. Uh, the aim of the association was to foster research, education, and welfare of the patients. British Diabetes Association later became Diabetes UK. Even today, Diabetes UK is a very big organization helping a lot of people. And Dr. Lawrence, along with Joseph Hutt of uh, Belgium, formed the International Diabetes Federation, which we call as IDF. Uh, in fact, Dr. Lawrence was the first uh, president uh, of IDF, and he was the president for IDF for about 10 years. So this is how the Diabetes Association is formed. And Dr. R. D. R. Lawrence, uh, dot, uh, his uh, diabetic ward was very famous in the King's College London. You can see uh, the diabetic ward here in this photograph. And Lawrence realized that BC practitioners had neither the time or nor the knowledge to teach the patients with the existing schemes of dietary advice. So uh, he uh, knew fully well that the doctors can't do it for every patient about uh, giving advice regarding their diet. So he devised a simplified method, which he called the line ration diet scheme, which got published in British Medical Journal. 
So this was uh, used, in fact, in the World War time also, line ration diet scheme. So whatever uh, uh, advice he gave about rationing the food was followed in uh, providing food for the soldiers during the World War. In 1927, he was joined by R.A. McCann's, an expert chemist. Actually, this expert chemist, R.A. McCann's, joined medicine to become a doctor later on. So when he joined King's College to study medicine, he was picked up by uh, Dr. Lawrence because of, for his uh, uh, ability in analyzing the foodstuffs. So along with uh, McCann's, he published the booklet called Chemical Composition of Foods. It's a very important uh, advancement in science. Then he brought an another important book, The Diabetic Life. It's controlled by diet and insulin. Again, the objective of this book was to bring the modern treatment of diabetes by diet and insulin within the scope of the general practitioner and the understanding of the patient whose intelligent cooperation is necessary for the best results. So even those times he knew that unless the patient is motivated, unless the patient is cooperative with the doctor's advice, uh, things won't move forward. So the book incorporated the line ration diet scheme, which I uh, spoke about. And uh, this book saw 12 uh, editions constantly revised, almost annual intervals uh, editions appeared because it was so much in demand. Every year, another edition uh, was uh, printed and the publishers assigned sufficient paper for its publication during the wartime when supplies of paper were extremely limited and rationed. So it was a book both for the doctor and the patient. Then he published uh, Food Tables, very, very important book again for uh, the homemakers uh, to, to be used in the kitchen. So everything was uh, given in detail. So for example, preparation of brown biscuit, special points to be observed by the diabetic, foods allowed during starvation, so all that. So very detailed uh, book. Then he realized that uh, the anything which he publishes should be simple to reach the common patient. So in 1929, Lawrence published the first edition of the Diabetic ABC, which is a very short practical book for patients and nurses. This ABC confines itself to practical details, mostly about diet and aims at showing di the diabetic how to live easily and comfortably as well as healthily. So he said during a meeting that this book contains what I should like to teach every patient if I had enough time. Obviously, when a lot of patients are waiting, the doctors find it very difficult to teach everything to the patient. So if we have a booklet like this, then it will be easy. So it is like Lawrence speaking to them if they read it thoroughly. And this Diabetes UK Foundation uh, was started in 1934 by Lawrence and Hedgy Wells, which is even very strong today. And uh, this is a biography bo uh, book about uh, Dr. Lawrence. It is interesting to know that Lawrence, after finishing medicine, joined the uh, British military and he was posted in India. So he was in uh, India, Pakistan, uh, unified India, uh, both in Shimla and Peshawar. He was about, uh, he was working there about for one and a half years before uh, he moved to London again to uh, do his uh, surgery training. So he was in India as a soldier for one and a half years representing British military. Then we'll move on to the uh, most important uh, of the four. Uh, this uh, this uh, person forms the chunk of this presentation, Elliot P. Jocelyn. Uh, he was born in 1869 in Boston, founder of the Jocelyn Clinic, world's uh, first diabetes care facility. He developed the role of diabetes educator, which we'll uh, uh, cover in the uh, forthcoming slides. He published many books, among them 10 medical textbooks and 10 manuals for the mutual use of doctor and the patient. Like Lawrence, he also believed in educating the patients. Elliot P. Jocelyn was a prodigy. At age 24, he published his first paper as a medical student when he was studying in Harvard Medical School. Uh, this uh, particular paper uh, about pathology of diabetes mellitus was published in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, which was later rechristened as the famous New England Journal of Medicine. So on March 29, 1894, as a student, he published the first paper on pathology of diabetes. Then uh, during a um, sojourn to Alps, Mount Alps, he met uh, this lady, young lady, who became his wife uh, later on. 
so they loved and then uh, she was a, an american uh, visiting alps around that same time uh, they got married and they had three children this is uh, um, uh, first kid mary and this is a palatial bungalow where they live actually jocelyn jocelyn's father was a big leather merchant so they were uh, already millionaires and uh, uh, he he had a lot of uh, funds at his disposal so he built this huge house uh, and uh, both uh, his he and his wife moved in there they were living in the second floor apartment and uh, the down, ground floor and other floors were used as the clinic and in his clinic desk he had one single book that is uh, the textbook of medicine written by dr william osler sir william osler was his uh, uh, mentor Uh, so he had this book on his table and when william osler a canadian by birth uh, who was uh, heading the medicine unit in uh, baltimore john hopkins hospital baltimore when he uh, formed an inter urban clinical club with four uh, young doctors four young clinicians from four cities which included boston uh, baltimore new jersey and philadelphia so four from boston uh, were chosen one was jocelyn so he chose 16 young doctors from all over america uh, as club members and he uh, dr osler headed the club it was a very prestigious uh, inclusion for jocelyn so he was chosen as a promising talent by a, by the high priest of medicine of that time so that uh, gave him lot of uh, enthusiasm to do more and this was the first meeting conducted by william osler at john hopkins hospital baltimore you can see the date uh, april 28th and 29th 1905 this is about uh, 16 years before insulin got discovered so there were uh, programs friday uh, and saturday ward visit clinical demonstration all that you can see interestingly uh, dr erlanger a student of uh, uh, dr osler was to demonstrate ex- heart block so he uh, demonstrated a heart block with an animal model so he just uh, uh, held the sa node with an artery and uh, uh, just uh, blocked that sa node and uh, caused heart block for that animal and demonstrated so animal experiment was done then osler took all these 16 young uh, in, uh, clinicians to the ward to see a patient so this patient donald mccormick had a uh, complete heart block he was uh, admitted in john hopkins in osler's unit uh, the all the investigate the young clinicians visited him uh, osler gave a, a clinical demonstration of uh, this particular patient then this patient got discharged uh, after the club meeting was over in 1942 some 37 years later uh, the president of dauphin deposit and trust company which was uh, a name for the big bank around that time in pennsylvania consulted jocelyn with diabetes when this person came and jocelyn took an ecg and realized that he has got complete heart block something struck him he just asked this patient are you uh, william osler's patient the person said yes i was uh, treated by william mosler about 30 40 years back then he realized this was the uh, clinical case which was demonstrated by osler himself and still 37 years later with complete heart block the person is still living heading a big bank and then uh, uh, he presented this uh, patient's history he took again i uh, investigated him fully and uh, at the 100th meeting of that inter urban club Uh, in baltimore jocelyn provided the follow up of this patient with heart block who osler had presented at that first meeting so this patient worked uh, regularly until uh, the day of his death in may 1945 at the age of 77 his demise was sudden and occurred 50 years after complete heart block had been diagnosed so such was his uh, remembrance and this inter urban clinical club is still strong and the membership is very very limited and uh, to become a member four uh, uh, current members should propose the name of the person and uh, they should have a lot of credentials 
only a few hundreds are uh, the members of the club today this is a 200th anniversary meeting of uh, the club in baltimore which happened in 2009 and uh, i have shown you this photograph uh, jocelyn's original practice where he lived as well as practiced 81 bay state road boston and where he kept a ledger so jocelyn was very famous for his meticulous record keeping on august 2nd uh, 19 uh, sorry, 1893, Jocelyn examined Mary Higgins, a young girl with diabetes. In fact, he was a, a house surgeon when this girl got admitted in Harvard Medical School when he was a medical student. So he remembered this girl and then when he started practicing diabetology in his own private practice, uh, again Mary Higgins uh, became his patient. Then he started this lecture, you can uh, ledger, you can see Mary Higgins' uh, case was the first entry that Jocelyn made in the ledger that he kept for the rest of his uh, career. So this is a page one. You can see the page one of uh, Jocelyn's uh, diabetes ledger, where you can see number one is Higgins Mary. And eventually his ledgers filled 80 volumes. So it's huge uh, 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 books. And uh, during his practice, he filled 80 volumes and became the center, which became the central registry for diabetes in the United States. The first system for recording patient diabetes data. So, so this is the first patient, Mary Higgins. And interestingly, the eighth patient was his own mother, uh, Sarah P. Jocelyn. Sarah Proctor Jocelyn was his mother. She also developed diabetes around 19, uh, 15 or 16. Before insulin got discovered, unfortunately, she died. So uh, Jocelyn actually uh, tried his best to uh, keep her alive, but he couldn't. So number eight was his mother. And you can see uh, the plot in Jocelyn's hospital uh, where they have mentioned that insulin was uh, first administered in this block. You can see this block uh, closely here. Near this spot on August 7th, 1922, Dr. Howard Root, uh, in the presence of Dr. Elliot P. Jocelyn, Howard Root was, Dr. Jocelyn's first assistant and others gave the first injection of insulin in New England. New England is old terminology for United States of America. The patient was Miss Elizabeth Mudge Oren, who with insulin was restored to health and lived for 25 years thereafter. Actually, she was a nurse, registered nurse. Oren is registered nurse. And another famous patient of Jocelyn, uh, George Binot, actually in previous webinars we covered, he was the Nobel laureate uh, for the discovery of uh, uh, vitamin B12 treatment for pernicious anemia. So Dr. Minot got diagnosed with uh, type 1 diabetes in 1920, fortunately one or two years before the discovery of insulin. And Minot's father was a famous neurologist who was a mentor of uh, Dr. Jocelyn when he was in Harvard Medical School. So obviously he had a very special interest when uh, his uh, mentor's son developed diabetes and already Minot was a very promising physician. So Dr. Jocelyn took personal interest to treat him and then control his diabetes. Then it became very routine for Jocelyn uh, to treat diabetes with insulin. So in fact, he published a paper where he mentions the routine treatment of diabetes with insulin, which is in June 2nd, 1923. So within a year, he became well-versed with insulin therapy. But then he also realized that uh, usage of insulin need to be very carefully, dose need to be adjusted. So he said, insulin is a remedy primarily for the wise and not the foolish, whether they be patients or doctors. Everyone knows it requires brains to live long with diabetes, but to use insulin successfully requires more than brains. This statement was made in 1923 and it's even true today where we have got 30, 40 varieties of insulin which can be administered in various permutations and combinations. So insulin therapy is an art even today. And Jocelyn wrote the first textbook of diabetes in 1916. And he, in that he noted a 20% decrease in mortality when patients instituted a program of diet and exercise. Even before the discovery of uh, insulin in 1916 itself, he found that if the patients followed diet and exercise, the, the mortality rate decreased by 20%. And then uh, you can see in this uh, uh, picture, after 1920, the uh, mortality drops drastically because of the arrival of insulin. 
And this is the diabetic manual written by Dr. Jocelyn. You can see the color changes which happen with Benedict solution for urine testing on the left-hand side. So he uh, dedicated this book to those individuals who have conquered diabetes by living longer with it than they were expected to live without it. So uh, this uh, uh, is way of, his way of telling uh, that he is dedicating the book to his diabetic patients. And he published a lot of books which were even uh, famous today. And he, apart from doing his practice, he was a professor at Harvard Medical School, very uh, friendly professor for his students. And Dr. Harvey Cushing, uh, the famous uh, neurosurgeon, was a classmate of Jocelyn. And he is in the back row. In this picture, it is mentioned that Dr. Harvey Cushing is in the back row, but I don't know who Harvey Cushing is in this uh, back row. So anyway, this is uh, uh, one aspect of Dr. Uh, uh, Jocelyn, where he was a teacher. And he was very much impressed by troika. Troika is a Russian word meaning a vehicle pulled by three horses. This type of vehicle is used in uh, old uh, time Russia. So Dr. Jocelyn created a three horse chariot symbol to reflect his philosophy of living with diabetes. The three horse motif symbolized one is one horse is diet, the second horse is exercise and third one is insulin, whether it is doctor given insulin or the endogenous insulin which is secreted within our body. Only if all the three are there, then the diabetes can get controlled properly, which are all needed to achieve victory over diabetes. And he was a pioneer in group patient education. Every week, uh, he conducted group uh, patient education meetings where he used to explain everything to the patient. And then he started awarding medals for those patients who uh, uh, lived long with without developing any complications of diabetes. This is a 10-year medal. So anybody uh, living for 10 years on insulin without any complication, then he will award this medal in a function for those patients. So uh, this medal depicts a boy, his dog and a boat. Actually, this boy is a, was actually a patient. So some case number 563 or something. So uh, uh, from his uh, photograph, they uh, devise, uh, devised this medal. And on the opposite side of the medal, there was the phrase prolonging lifespan after the onset of diabetes, a scientific and moral victory. And then he initiated the concept of nurse educators. So he also called them wandering nurses because he used to send the nurses to the people who are ailing at home. So on nurse educators, he said, a well-trained nurse is of more value than the patient's doctors. A good nurse is more, uh, more than uh, a doctor. And on the importance of preventive education, he said teaching is cheaper than nursing. So, and he was uh, ably assisted by many of his assistants. One of, one of them was Root, Dr. Root. The second one was Priscilla White, who took care of all his uh, type 1 children and pregnant ladies. Here you can see uh, the record of uh, Jocelyn Clinic from 1898 to 1979, where the initial survival rate, fetal survival rate was only 40% uh, before the discovery of insulin and maternal survival was around 67%, which improved to 98% survival, fetal survival and 100% maternal survival after discovery of insulin. And again, this was the book written by Dr. Jocelyn, The Treatment of Diabetes Mellitus, which has seen many editions. And uh, Jocelyn was very friendly to the kids. Uh, the kids uh, considered him as uh, their grandfather and he used to move with them very freely and he started a lot of diabetes camps uh, to train the children. So he had a 300 acre farm. I've, I've told you that he was a, a wealthy person. So he bought a 300 acre farm uh, near Boston and where uh, he had a lot of uh, play area and other things for the children uh, to camp there. So they, uh, the children were kept in the camps for about two weeks, three weeks where they got trained in everything. Uh, by the time they finished their camp, they, they were masters of their diabetes. And the children also uh, uh, were very uh, 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 enthusiastic about everything and they named their sleeping cabins with their insulin brand names. Uh, in, 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 insula, insulmon, it was insulin. 
and Iolatin. Iolatin was one of the brand names. Myrtle, um, Myrtilin was one of the brand names. So they named their sleeping cabins like Insulin, Iolatin, Myrtilin, and they were uh, given saccharin for uh, sweetening their beverages. So saccharin. So uh, they were enjoying their times, and they were uh, uh, actually publishing a. A magazine for themselves, the campus, the children. It is called. It was called Needle Point News because their life revolves around that needle point, insulin uh, uh, syringe needle. So it was a magazine for the little campus. And uh, Jocelyn included a lot of cases, uh, actual cases in his book. Here you can see uh, Barbara uh, after taking insulin. She was she is doing a handstand. So he took a lot of pride in the, the children's ability to live a healthy life, full normal lives after taking insulin. And this is one of the camp uh, scene where the children uh, were enjoying a hay ride around the farm. And uh, Jocelyn also received a lot of contributions from uh, his uh, patients. So one of them, uh, this was a letter written by a 15 year old shoe shine boy actually very poor boy. He developed diabetes and Jocelyn treated him uh, freely uh, in his uh, uh, Jocelyn clinic for a few weeks and then sent him back home. And the boy actually, uh, since he was poor, he was earning uh, an income by shining the shoe of people who are uh, uh, frequenting the road. And uh, in 1931, he wrote a letter sending $1 to Dr. Jocelyn. So that was his income for uh, many days where he wrote, Dear Dr. Jocelyn, I received a letter the other day knowing of the great work uh, being done in the Dequinus Hospital. Uh, I want to help with all I can. I decided to send all the money I made last Saturday shining shoes uh, in my father's shoe shop. As I made exactly $1, I am enclosing it in this letter. I only... Um, with it could be much more. I only wish it could be much more. However, I'm sure there are more fortunate people who will donate larger sums. He was uh, ever truly, uh, he uh, signs his name. So very moving, touching uh, letter. And uh, in 1950, uh, he published, Jocelyn published his data. Uh, I told you that he had uh, kept about 80 ledgers, huge volumes containing thousands of patients' data. Then he analyzed all the data and uh, realized that uh, good treatment definitely led to uh, the decreased mortality rate. So he was comparing here Nounin era, Allen era, Banting era, Hagdown era, and Best era. So where he is not uh, giving the name as Jocelyn era, even though Best was a physiologist and he never uh, treated diabetic patient, but since he was the only discoverer alive, around 1940 to 50, uh, he mentions that it is the best era. So such was uh, Dr. Jocelyn's uh, nature, good nature. And uh, New England Journal of Medicine honored uh, when Jocelyn celebrated his 90th birthday by publishing a, a separate um, a volume or a magazine uh, celebrating his uh, achievements. So this was a particular uh, magazine where uh, they celebrated his 90th birthday by a commemorative volume. And then in 1948, he instituted another medal, the quarter century medal, those who lived for 25 years, because this marked again the uh, insulin discoveries 25th year. And he made a statement again, I uh, look upon the diabetic as a charioteer. And his chariot is uh, as drawn by three steeds named diet, insulin, and exercise. It takes skill to drive one horse, intelligence to manage a team of two, but a man must be very good teamster who can get all three to pull together. So uh, again, he makes a very nice statement saying that it's not easy for the patient to manage diet, exercise, and insulin all together, but only if they can manage all three together, they can have a fruitful long life. And the, this was the second Jocelyn medal. And the same emblem was uh, given to his boss, Jocelyn Diabetes Foundation. So, uh, and uh, before we end, he had his nemesis also. There was a doctor called Dr. Edward Tolstoy, uh, who was a professor at Cornell, a professor of medicine Cornell, 
who was against Jocelyn's idea of uh, dietary therapy and insulin adjustment, uh, all that. He was advocating free diet for diabetics rather than precise limited diet. Uh, he said, why should we treat uh, diabetic patients unless they have symptoms? So only when they de start developing symptoms, we need to treat them with small doses of insulin. Otherwise, so they can have free diet and the, we need not torture them with a lot of diet and exercise advice. This was his idea. So he promoted relaxed control. And in one of the meetings, uh, a big conference where uh, um, Dr. Edward Tolstoy had a, uh, an argument with uh, Dr. Uh, Elliot P. Jocelyn, and he was uh, uh, not at all speaking in a nice way. So to the stunned audience, uh, as they watched, Tolstoy became very vocal against uh, Jocelyn's uh, ideas, but then he was proven wrong. Uh, so finally, when he died, uh, when Edward Tolstoy died, uh, his obituary was uh, uh, this, th that's how uh, the society regarded him. Like uh, when he, uh, during his death, only a small obituary was published, nothing else was there to celebrate his achievements. And Elliot P. Jocelyn at 81 years, a dedicated new building of New England Deconis Hospital. And uh, as he became older and older, he was uh, seeing patients. And even uh, in his 90s, up to 92 years he lived, uh, till the week he died, he was seeing 15 patients every day. So he was also called a Boston Brahmin. Actually, this was a term coined by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Uh, in a book called Elsie Wenner, he described Boston's aristocracy as a Brahmin caste of New England because they embraced the values of their Purit Puritan forebears, hard work, thrift, culture, and educa education. The term had been applied to the old wealthy New England families of British Protestant origin who were influential in the development of American institutions and culture. By the 1830s, an elite corporation of Boston Brahmins governed Harvard Medical School, Harvard Business School, and uh, the students of elite families filled its halls. So this, the entire Harvard Medical School as well as Business School uh, was uh, run by these uh, Boston uh, Protestants who were uh, originally descendants of Britain uh, and they were just uh, maintaining their uh, ideals. Jocelyn always wore a watch case and chain. If the picture shown were full length, it would reveal his high button shoes, which required special laces. Even when he was 92 years, he was wearing a full suit. You could never see him in a casual attire. He, he always presented himself with a full suit to his patients. He remained comfortable with that attire until the end with the manners and dress of a 1912 Boston Brahmin. So this is uh, Dr. Elliot P. Jocelyn, a week before his death, 92 years in his office. So to conclude, Frederick Madison Allen advocated starvation therapy, which often temporarily returned the blood glucose of type one patients to normal levels, but only succeeded in extending their life for a year or so in the severe juvenile cases. Dr. Banting, Though not trained as a physician, though he was a surgeon, he practiced diabetology for one year after the discovery of insulin, and he resurrected many dying children with insulin. So uh, he did wonders to those children, and he was loved by the children. Dr. Elliot P. Jocelyn is remembered as the best diabetologist who bridged the period immediately before insulin's discovery and the exciting clinical demonstration of its effectiveness in the following decades. So he just used insulin admirably well, and many of his patients lived long without developing any complications. Finally, Dr. Robin Lawrence, a diabetic himself, on dietary therapy only in his early 20s, survived for many years and fortunate to get the insulin himself uh, as treatment and became the leading diabetes specialist in England. So that is why all these four are called the saviors of insulin era. Thanks for your patient listening.